pray. Father, we are in awe of you this morning. Lord, reminded, Lord, again this morning and seeing a glimpse of your glory. Lord, reminded of your love. Lord, reminded of your power that is in the name of your son, Jesus, the power to save, the power to heal. Lord, we worship you, the one and living God. And Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that you have poured out among us this morning. And Lord, we just ask that you would continue in our midst and we're, and we're confident, Lord, that you will because you are faithful. Lord, bless us and speak to, into our hearts, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to be home. Thank the church for their sponsoring of Kurt and I back to North Carolina. We got to see, I don't think I've ever been in North Carolina, but it's, it's lovely back there. And it was a blessing to be, uh, spend the week with those gentlemen and, and uh, just to fellowship together with others uh, that... Uh, Love the gospel, love the Lord, and, uh, and in pursuit of greater truth. We had an interesting week on, on studying some topics, and I won't go, get into them at this point, but uh, feel free to ask me about them. But, but thank you uh, to the church for allowing us uh, that privilege to do that. It is good to be here this morning, and, and I just pray that you are blessed and that God speaks into your heart. God is here. God is speaking, isn't he? God is... Uh, very much able to speak into our lives and our hearts and give us that message that we need to hear. So it's wonderful to be here in God's house. I also wanted to just extend a couple of thank yous. Uh, thank you to all the guys that were there last Sunday uh, um, in the rain, right? I believe it rained some, but I uh, just want to say thank you to uh, our guys. And if you didn't get a chance to go out there and look at that, uh, be sure to do that. They made some wonderful improvements. And uh, it's, it's a process, isn't it? It's a journey uh, to, to take bare ground and turn it into a facility that, that God uh, can use and that would glorify uh, the work of God and, and glorify him and, and bring about his, his work in this earth. So just thank you for that. Also, next week, as, as the Brother Gordon has already mentioned, we have our 75th um, celebration, 75 years, 75 years. That's a good amount of time, isn't it? And uh, we want to give God the praise, God the praise for his faithfulness to sustain uh, our church, to sustain us and keep us and to cause us to grow and, and cause us to be a blessing to many, to many, right? And I know that in particular, this church has, has been a blessing in many ways to the greater um, uh, churches at large, if you will. And so it's, it's going to be a wonderful time. I just encourage you to uh, block that time out uh, next week, even the afternoon service, right? If you're like me, right, you're eating and you're thinking nap time. And no, 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 no. You got to be here in the afternoon and, and uh, it'll be a wonderful service. And so I just want to encourage you to be part of that. Amen. Believing for the lost. Believing for the lost. Do you know... That your, church, that your faith, do you know that your faith moves God? If you're a Christian, you need to know that, right? You need to know that your faith moves God. Look at this verse in Matthew 17, 20. Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith, as a mustard seed, which was a very tiny seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, I have to admit, this is one of those scriptures that we were a little uncomfortable with, right? We don't fully understand what God is promising to us. But it's there, right? It's there in the word, and we have to deal with it. And God calls us to faith. 
Maybe another way of, another example that we can think of is, is Sarah. The word of God tells us that Sarah, Abraham's wife, that by faith, she received strength to what? To bear a child. To bear a child. The word tells us that by faith, she received strength that she could conceive and bear Isaac because she counted him faithful who had promised, right? Who had promised. So we see there that faith, faith was this catalyst, was this doorway that, that if I can describe it this way, Sarah walked through and God blessed her in fulfilling his promise to her and to Abraham. Of course, faith indeed is powerful. Faith moves mountains because in whom our faith is placed, right? That's to say that our faith in and of itself only moves mountains as it is placed in God because it is God who moves the mountains, right? It is God who moves the mountains. Our faith is not a power in and of itself, but it is effective and it is powerful because in whom it is placed, who is God? And it is ultimately God that moves the mountains, and I want to say this, that we know that faith is effective when it is placed in God and, and, and I want to emphasize this, and his promises, right? Because God, faith, this powerful faith that the scriptures talk about is not just about us placing our faith in God for whatever we choose or whatever we want, right? I'm believing God for that 10,000 square foot home, right? I'm believing God for that Cadillac. That's not, what, that's not what makes faith effective. That's not what makes faith powerful. Faith is powerful when it is placed in God and his promises. We must link our faith with the promises of God. We cannot just believe God for something that is not in his word, right? We'll be shooting ourselves in the foot. And so we must make this connection between God and his promises. When we speak of faith, we must make the connection between God and what God has promised. Again, faith is not effective when, when we simply make up what we're going to believe, but rather when we believe in God's promises. Today's message is really a continuation of the messages from two and three weeks ago which were entitled Praying for the Lost and Reaching for the Lost. And if you missed those, I would encourage you to go and, and, and listen to them and provide some context. When we speak of faith as Christians, when we, when we talk about the faith that, that the Bible calls us to, when we speak about faith of the patriarchs, right, and the prophets, and the people of God, uh, of the Old Testament, or even in the New Testament, when we speak about faith, what we're really saying, and we could simply put it this way, that it is about believing God. Faith is, simply put, believing God. And this faith, that this belief is not based on what we're seeing, right, with our, with our natural eye or what we're experiencing, but it is based upon a loving trust in God. It is based upon a loving trust in the character of God, that God is good, that God is faithful. And further, that God's word is sure and that it's true. And that God is worthy of our trust. And I think that when we understand faith in this way, that it is believing God, we really, we, we take it out of the mysterious and we put it into the very practical. Right? Sometimes we, we, we do tend to... Uh, make faith a mystery, and yet when we boil it down to what it's really about, it's about believing God out of a loving trust in his character. 
and that he's faithful. Again, biblical faith is not based upon what we're seeing or even what we're experiencing. And by that, I mean seeing with our natural eye, but again, based upon a loving trust in God and his promises. I want you to consider this scripture, Genesis 17, 4 and 5. It'll be in front of you. Oh, that's interesting. It took out my pictures on my PowerPoint. (laughs) That's okay. The word is there and that's what's important. I want you to consider the promise that God made to Abraham. Here it is in front of us. My covenant or my agreement, my contract is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, which is exalted father, but your name shall be Abraham, which is father of a multitude. For I have made you a father of many nations. Now this is God speaking to Abram, changing his name to Abraham. And I want you to hear what God is saying. God told Abraham, I have made you a father of many nations. But the reality is, the truth is, that Isaac, his son, his legitimate heir, wouldn't be born for another year. And yet God is declaring this. The reality is that Abraham's son Isaac, his heir, the line through which the nation of Israel would be born, he wouldn't come along for another year. Abraham was 99 years old. Sarah was past her time of bearing children. But God was speaking into the life of Abraham and God was saying, I'm changing your name, right? I'm changing your name. The reality was, if we, if we look at this in the context of Scripture, God was calling forth those things that were not into existence by his very word. And Abraham, contrary to everything that he was seeing with his natural eye, right? Contrary to what he was experiencing in the natural, and we don't need to, to go into the details on that, but I think we can understand what Abraham's predicament was, Contrary to hope, he believed God. Abraham had faith, biblical faith. Look at this next scripture because scripture says it best. Romans 4, 19. It says, Abraham, not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He didn't consider that. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness, which is another sermon a lifelong pursuit of understanding God's redemption and plan of salvation. Again, Abraham believed God. And again, not based on what he was experiencing because his experience was telling him, this isn't going to happen. This is not going to happen. But out of a loving trust in the character of God, that God was faithful, that God was well able to perform his word. That was true faith. What I want to say today is that faith, faith in God, is absolutely necessary in co-laboring with God for the souls of men or people. I mean men in the general sense, humanity. And we could make it more specific than that, that faith in what God has said is needed, is absolutely necessary in co-laboring with God for souls. And I refer to it as co-laboring with God because God does, right? Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says that he, that he was a fellow worker with God. I refer to it as co-laboring with God because he has commanded us, right, to go out into his what? Into his fields and work. And so God has called us to co-labor with him, to partner with him in declaring the word, in declaring the message of the kingdom, of the gospel. God has called us to co-labor with him in the proclamation of the gospel that brings salvation to those who believe. 
And so I want to say this, that we as a church, we can, we can pray for the lost, which I talked about, I believe, three weeks ago. We can do that, and we should do that. And we, as the church, can know that without Jesus Christ, all are lost. And we can know that it is only through the gospel that the lost are found. We can pray, and we can know, and we can do that. But if we don't couple prayer and knowledge and effort with faith, we're finished before we begin. That's the challenge. That's the battle. Can you imagine Noah, right, laying down that first beam for the ark and saying to himself, this is, this is not going to work. This is not going to work. God's not going to save me. God's not going to bring the animals. The animals aren't going to come. The boat won't float. I don't even know what I'm doing. Can you imagine Noah saying that? God would be displeased. If you understand and see the scriptures and the call to faith, God would be displeased. And I think we'd, we'd hear one word. Next. I'm looking for another Noah. I think that's what would happen. Remember, what did God tell Zacharias for his lack of faith? Remember the story, the proclamation, his wife would bear a child and he wavered in unbelief. God told him, you're not going to speak. You're not going to speak until after it's come to pass. To pray for the lost and to know that Jesus saves is good, right? It's awesome. But we must couple it with faith. We must join it with faith in the promises of God. And by that, I mean that our efforts in prayer must be accompanied by a belief that God will answer, that he will move, that the Holy Spirit will be poured out, that conviction will fall, which is the work of God, right? We can convict no one. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That those in darkness, that those who are lost will be found. We must couple our prayer and our effort with this faith. Why? Because God is faithful to perform his word, and God has made many promises to us as his people. Amen? Consider the promises concerning evangelism. Jesus has said he, would, he has promised to be with us to the end. Amen? He has promised that he would be there walking with us in that conversation. He has promised to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. Are you asking for more of the Holy Spirit? Are you asking? God has promised you that he will give you his Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of power and of love and of wisdom, of boldness, of revelation, of wisdom. He has promised that the Holy Spirit will convict, right? Jesus said when the Holy Spirit has come, he will convict the world of what? Of sin, of righteousness, right? You got opposites. He's going to convict of sin. He's going to convict of righteousness and of judgment. This call to make a decision. He has promised that the blind will see. Jesus said that was his anointing, which he, I believe he has given to his people. The oppressed will be delivered. He has promised that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen? God has promised that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord. And perhaps best of all, Jesus has promised to build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen? Amen? This is what we're called to believe. This is what we're called to faith when we pray. Yes, that the Holy Spirit will be poured out. Yes, Jesus will be with us. Yes, Jesus is building his church. Yes, the Holy Spirit will convict. And yes, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The promises of, of God, if I can say it like this, are like a light switch on the wall and faith turns them on. But if we don't believe his promises, we'll be like the one who buried his talent, right? We'll be like Israel who 
was there before the promised land and they left it all behind because of unbelief. The reality is, is that if we don't believe his promises, we won't be effective. Because little faith in God means little move of God. Now, I agree that not all will receive the message, but some will. Many will. Amen? Many have. Many have received. Praise God. It is true that when God calls the church to evangelism, he has not called us to an exercise in futility, has he? Amen? God is not weak. God does not call us to prayer to be merely pious, right? Or as some exercise of religious duty. God does not call us to share only to fill the, earth, the, 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 the air with words, right? That's not the purpose of God's calling the church to evangelism. But God calls us to prayer and proclamation to win souls, That's why God's calling us, is to win souls. Amen? There's a story in the New Testament I want to look at that Jesus pointedly calls us to faith, calls the disciples to faith. It's, it's a tough story, but it's in the Word, and I think we need to look at it. Matthew 9, 17 through 29. It says, one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit, and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth. He becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples, and they, that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground, and he wallowed, and he foamed at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, Jesus, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, This kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. You know, there are many things in this story that stand out that, that someone could sh- preach on and share on and think on. The heartbreak of a parent, right, struggling with their child's desperate need. We hear, we hear the father's heart as he pleads with Jesus, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Luke tells us that this was his only child, I love the man's transparency, right? We need to be transparent when we go to prayer, right? God sees it all anyways. Might as well just open up and let him know. I love his transparency when he says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. That he was open, that he was desperate, that he was humble. And if you've gone through a similar journey, you can, you can empathize, you can sympathize, you, you can identify with this father's cry. 
The desperate need of the child stands out in this story, doesn't it? Possessed of a demon, a, a spirit of destruction that would throw him into the fire, throw him into the water to destroy him. One who convulsed, one who would foam at the mouth. And this was a, a struggle from childhood. The desperate need of the child stands out to me in this story. The crisis. The inability of the disciples to help. You know, we read that Jesus said that this, comes, this one comes out ex, not except by fasting and prayer. But Matthew adds that Jesus said, you didn't do it because of your unbelief also. Their inability. Certainly the disciples were called to this moment, weren't they? They were called to be the agents of Jesus Christ. They were called to be disciples. They were called to be apostles. They were called for this moment to be ready, and yet they were unable. Probably a variety of reasons, but one of the things that Jesus mentioned was their unbelief. And the father's doubt, again, stands out. His question, even about Jesus, note the way he said it. He said, if you can do anything. He wasn't so sure. As he looked and he cried out to Jesus, he said, if you can. He wasn't 100%. Perhaps what grabs our attention uh, the most is, can we describe it as the anger of Christ? Maybe. His exasperation, certainly. His frustration. As Jesus comments, O faithless generation, Matthew adds, and perverse or twisted and crooked. Jesus is exasperated with his disciples, is he not? He's expecting more from them. And he says, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? I don't think we can help but notice that Jesus expected more from his disciples. But I think what is necessary today to, to consider is Jesus' challenge to the Father I see that Jesus was turning the tables on this father. The father said, if you can do anything, have compassion and help us. And Jesus turns the tables and he says, if you can believe. It's, it's an amazing challenge from Jesus. If we consider all that's going on, right? In the confusion, in the chaos that was going on, in the context of years and years of heartache, right? And grief of this father and his grieving. Jesus gives this incredible, and maybe some would think this insensitive challenge to this father. In all that's going on, Jesus gives this incredible challenge, believe. Believe. And more specific, we can get than that, in believe for the healing of your child. Again, I, I want us to note what's going on here to see the picture that the father in his desperation is coming to Jesus and he is saying, heal my son. And Jesus is saying, believe. We can know this about God that in all of our difficulties, in our trials, in our bondages, in our struggles, in our fears, in all of our diseases, God is calling us to faith, to confidence in him. Certainly we know this is true, don't we, that God of the sinner calls the sinner to faith. Amen? Amen. God calls the sinner to faith. God demands faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And isn't it true that when people remain lost, it is not for a lack of the power of God, but it is for a lack of faith that God calls and demands faith. I think the lesson here to know in this story is that this, this battle for this man's deliverance of his son was a battle of faith. For it was never about what Jesus could do, right? Because Jesus can do all things. 
But what the issue that Jesus brings to the man's attention and our attention is the father's faith. And we can say that his faith was weak, and I can say my faith is weak. But, you know, I think that the father, in his weakness, he did what we need to do, right? Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Of course, there is something that is much more important than physical healing, right? One can be healthy and whole their whole life, live to 100 years old. They can be healed of a disease, and yet their soul can still be lost, right? There's something that's more important than physical healing, and that's the issue of the healing of the soul that's sickened by sin. The saving of the soul, the salvation of the soul... And I ask this question today, if God asked for faith in this situation, in this story, how much more for our spiritual needs is God calling us to faith? Those issues of the inward man, right? If Jesus asked this father to believe on behalf of his child, I have no doubt that Jesus is asking of us to believe for those who are spiritually sick to have faith. The truth is that Jesus is calling us to faith for the spiritual healing of the people that are in our lives, that we live with, that we work with, who surround us in the same way that he asks faith of the Father. How do we do that? Number one, we put our confidence in God, that God is at work. Despite what we're seeing, despite what we're hearing, despite what we're experiencing, we're trusting that God is at work in the soul of that person that we're praying for. God is calling us to faith. God is calling us to confidence that he's at work, that he's hearing our prayer. And number two, we move in faith and we show the world our confidence in God and the power of his redemption. Amen. We believe in a God that can save. We believe in a God that can redeem. We believe in a God who raises the poor, right, out of the dust. Amen. That's the God that we serve. How do we do that very practically? We can do this by coming alongside the one whom the world and oftentimes the church will discard, they will throw out, and they will say they're unredeemable. We've given up on them, and yet God in faith calls us, God calls us in faith to come alongside the one that the world discards. The world's going to be amazed, right, as we stand in faith with those whom they've cast aside. Even many in the church are going to ask the question, what are you doing with that person? What are you doing? We can move in faith by believing for their restoration. How do we do that? We come alongside the one that is cast off again out of a belief, out of a faith that God, that God, that God is working. Amen? But if we don't believe in what God has promised us, if we don't believe that God is working, we'll never come alongside. We'll never go. And so God calls us to faith. We can believe that Christ is there with you, the Holy Spirit is leading, that the Holy Spirit will work, that the Holy Spirit is there to bring salvation and deliverance to all who call upon the Lord that Christ is there in in your midst, building his church. How do we move in faith? Here's a challenge, and and I like to preach it myself, right? Forego a vacation and go on mission. That's faith. Believing that God is going to do something, right? Forego that new whatever and give help to the poor because you believe God is going to use that gift redemptively. Invest in the community of faith with your time, your energy, your resources because you believe that God is going to use that community of faith. He is going to use you to speak into the lives of others. So in closing, I want to ask again, do you know that your faith moves God? Why? Because he honors our faith. That's the way he's chosen to work, 
and we're just called to submit to it, right? We don't have to understand everything. We're just called to submit to it. Again, I want to close with Matthew 17, 20. It says, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. Faith, if you have faith, you will say, and it will move. If you can believe all things are possible. Again, we got to couple it with God and his word, right? It's not what we make up. And so the lesson today is the prayer of faith moves God. Would you stand, worship team? Father, we desire more of you. Lord, fill our hearts and our minds with your word. Lord, may we just confess afresh and anew, Lord, that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus saves, that Jesus is 
the way, the truth, and the life to you, Father. Lord, this morning, we just thank you that you are at work in our hearts, and Lord, that you're drawing us to yourself through your Son. Lord, we thank you that you are mighty to save. Lord, use us. Use us, Lord, to reach across the table, across the street. Lord, use us to speak into our families, and Lord, let us pray in faith. Lord, we worship you today. We just thank you for your faithfulness. Bless the food that we're about to eat, the breaking of bread in our fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.